Good day, folks. So good to be here with you. Here in Alberta, Canada, we are uh, in our springtime setting, time-wise, we sprung ahead one hour. And for those of us who might have forgot that, I hope we were not late to any church services or other th events this morning. Also, just thank you so much for inviting me into your homes. Uh, today the, to this, today is an unusual time for me to do this video because it's actually after our worship service. This week has been kind of hectic for me in different ways, and I postponed making this video till the afternoon today, Sunday. So then, thank you for having me with you. Thank you so much for following along in this series, if you've been doing that on a regular basis. And even if not, I, I pray and hope that this message from God's Word will, will encourage you today and will help you understand uh, God in greater ways and to worship Him in greater ways. So without any ado, let's begin. I want to mention uh, an individual here by the name of Mary Cassian. She is an author, an international speaker, and a professor uh, at uh, a theological school. And she said this one time, where is the line when it comes to teaching men? It's a question being asked by scores of women who want to be faithful to the Bible and want to exercise their spiritual gift of teaching in a way that honors God. Now, to be fair to Mary, I, I cherry-picked her words with this in mind for us today. To get us thinking right off the bat, to get those old gray cells moving, about a contentious issue in our culture, and it is so in the same way, in many ways, in the evangelical church. The role of men and women in the family and in the church. As we begin to think through this important issue, we will come to face to face with our own personal biases, our own opinions, our presuppositions, our own experiences, and even our own theologies. We need to be aware of that when we engage the Bible, that we do come with this kind of stuff. And to really be honest with ourselves, we also we need to understand that we bring to the table the influence of our families of origin and certainly the culture around us in many ways that we don't even realize. And, I'm, and there's a good reason I want you to consider this, because... Lots of understand, misunderstandings and disagreements and division and discord has resulted when we approach the biblical text with our emotional responses first. Because the role of men and women in the family and in the church is too important to let our personal biases and emotions become the major factors when we make sound biblical decisions about any teaching of the Bible, and specifically we're talking about men and women in the role of the church today. Of course, we don't toss out our emotions. God made us with emotions. This is part and parcel of why we are humans, part of our makeup, our design, and even our experiences in life, good or bad, in this particular issue, provide the training ground and the opportunity for us to learn and grow as a person, and certainly in our understanding of God, and how we are to relate to him and to each other and to the world around us. Because this is where all the major problems usually arise. Approaching this particular issue, this topic that we're going to be looking at today, what the Bible is uh, revealing to us, uh, sometimes we don't look at it or learn it or understand it biblically. We don't think biblically. We approach the Bible unbiblically for all those sorts of reasons I already mentioned. But today, let's study the Bible thinking biblically first. So let's uh, take a look at our text for today. Now, if you've been tracking with uh, the series, we uh, are going through 1 Timothy's uh, letter to Tim, uh, first Paul, Paul's first letter, pardon me, to Timothy, uh, writing about issues in the Ephesian church back then. 
And uh, we already went through chapter one, and I moved directly into chapter three, and now we're going to finish off today chapter two with this particular um, situation, this issue that we're talking about. So now we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 through to the end, 8 through to 15. So please uh, join me on, in your Bible or on your applications, whatever you're using, as we read. Verse 8, Therefore I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles, or gold, or pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good deeds, appropriate for men who profess to worship women, for women, excuse me again, who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Lord, bless the reading word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And as we even are reading this, maybe some of us are, 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 are cringing, possibly, with this conversation, or this topic about women and men in the church and in the family and in our world. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us to set aside our personal biases, even those negative, negative experiences we might have had in this situation, just for a moment. We don't want to dispute that terrible things have happened to women, but Lord, we want to see your word, understand your word biblically, and help us to understand this word that you have for us today. And may it bring you great glory and joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in order to think biblically, we start where the Apostle Paul here in this letter urged Timothy to start. Then Paul said, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made. We, that was in verse 1 of this chapter. And, and so much misunderstanding and argument and division over this issue of the role of men and women would be avoided if we would... Pray first. Always pray. By putting our trust in the Spirit of God, His Word, we can be assured we'll be on the right road to understanding and learning that what the Bible teaches concerning the role of men and women in the family and in the church. Just so you know, we're focusing in the church today. And even as we do that, as we think biblically, as we trust the Holy Spirit to guide us, if there's healing to be done, there will healing will come. I believe that. We always begin by prayer as we just done, as we, as we just completed. And, and now we consider the next important step in our understanding today is context. I don't think it's hard for us to appreciate and understand that Paul's letter was written in the first century. That's a long time ago, folks, right? 21 centuries ago, a lot of years have gone by. And when we read this text, we well by default read this text through our 21st century lens. It can't be helped because we are 21st century people. But to think biblically, we need for a moment or two to set the 21st century lens aside and put on the 1st century lens. This morning I, I left it at that, but I would add this, that even during studying the Bible and reading and trying to understand this issue, we need sometimes to switch lenses. But we do need to start off by understanding this through the first century lens. So if I can give you three tools to study and understand the Bible and its teachings and to grow in your knowledge of God, here's the three tools. One, prayer. Two, context. And three, think biblically. Tool, uh, prayer, uh, prayers, context, and think biblically. And this is what we'll use today as we move now into the text. So look at verse 8. And the very first word you'll find there is the therefore. And whenever you read in the Bible, therefore, we always ask the question, what's what therefore? Or what's, what's therefore? What's a therefore therefore? I think I just must that right up. Pardon me. It's been a long day. 
but no excuse. See, Paul is using this conjunction to remind his readers of what he had exhorted them to do in verse 1. What did he exhort them to do? Remember? To pray. Remember also in the Ephesian church in this particular setting was uh, in confusion and disorder. False teaching had made its way into the teaching of the church. So number one, Paul said, pray. Next he commands this particular thing for the men. Paul said, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Now this word I want is a command. It's not a when you choose to, when you shouldn't. It's a command. He wanted the men in the church to pray because this word men means men. It's not the generic term or the, in the sense of humanity or mankind. He wanted them to lift up holy hands without any anger or disputing. Now this lifting up holy hands uh, is easily understood by one word that's in that particular phrase and that's the word holy. And when we consider this particular word, let's go to the Bible for the commentary we need. Uh, King David said in his Psalm 24 verse 3 and 4, he, he said this, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord. Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. The one who has a clean hands and a pure heart. And then he went on to say in, in another one of his Psalms, Psalm 63 verse 4, he said this, I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. See, unholy things were happening in the church at Ephesus. For example, there was anger and disputing. It tells us that in verse 8. And we know also from the letter that this letter that false teaching and all this discord and stuff happening in the church had even caused some to shipwreck their faith. The word shipwreck is used as a metaphor. It destroyed their faith. We see that in the first chapter of this letter. And he mentions two people in particular, Hymenius and Alexander. So what was Paul doing here? He wanted Timothy to restore biblical worship in the church. When we look at verse, uh, verse actually the whole, the whole letter, but certainly here in verse 8 to 15 in the second letter, this is about restoring holy biblical worship in the Ephesian church. That's what he wanted to do. And he commanded the men, no doubt would include some of the elders, including Timothy, to restore holiness in their worship of God. Because wor biblical worship is very basic level is holy. And why is it holy? When I ask you that question, what's, what do you think? Why is it holy? Because, friends, God is holy. And God is the one that created us to worship Him. We'll go to, uh, to the Apostle Peter for commentary on this, where he said to those folks that he was writing to, and to us today, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written. And then Peter quotes Leviticus chapter 11, be holy because I am holy, where God gave this command to his people Israel. So now let's take a look at verse 9 to 11, sort of as a whole. And a good question to ask concerning the, these particular verses, 9, 10, and 11, is what was happening in the Ephesian church that Paul turned his attention toward the women in that church. He's being very specific here. Now, of course, we can't be exact. We don't know all of that. But the context, again, remember I said prayer context, think biblically. The context of the letter provides us with some clues. And it all begins, of course, as it always will, with false teachers and their teaching who, according to Paul, created this atmosphere of confusion and division when he said, later in his letter, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. We discussed this particular verse, actually, this morning in our adult uh, Sunday school. Anyways, Paul would go on to say that they produced, only this only thing this produced would be what Paul calls controversial speculations and rather than advancing the faith or God's work, this 
did away with it. Controversial speculations, Paul would say, rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. He commanded the men and the women to lift up holy hands because false teaching was holy and ungodly. So we can reason, even if we don't know the details, that some women may have been behaving arrogantly and impurely. So again, contextually, we need to keep two things in mind. The first thing we need to keep in mind is the church at Ephesus was, no doubt, primarily Gentile. Second thing about the first century, Gentile women in the first century often wove their jewelry, their pearls, as it says here, and their expensive jewelry into their hair. This was not only a sign of their wealth and status in the community, but also of their beauty. Now, we could make some sort of correlation to our 21st century mindset here in our world, in our time. But here's the point. No doubt this was causing distraction of different kinds. Because the church of Jesus Christ is not made up of just rich people. It's made up of poor people. So you can imagine that was distractive in that way. But also, something else was going on in the church was causing a disruption in the worship service. And verse 11 points out to this fact. Some women were most likely disturbing the worship service publicly. And Paul, as I mentioned, wants to restore biblical worship. And he exhorts these women to dress modestly with decency and propriety. Now, the New Living Translation renders this verse 9 here for us in a way that helps us understand what he's getting at here. We read, I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. You see, that's what was happening there. They were drawing attention to them. They're distracting people from the worship service. We're to worship God. Now, Paul was not teaching a specific dress code, folks. Some people take it to that extent. Or a hairstyle. Absolutely not. But what he was addressing was the most important thing that God wants to know and, and is interested in is our heart attitude toward him. Our heart attitude. And again, we go back to the Apostle Peter to add commentary to help us understand this. When he said to women in his letter, first letter, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, rather it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of a great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. Now, again, let's not read this particular, not understand this particular text from Peter's letter through our cultural lens. Okay, let's set that aside for a second. There's no indication in here that being a quiet spirit or gentle means anything but that. Okay? But we want to take a time out. We want to take a, a breath. There's a lot of stuff that just happened here, a lot of things that I've just said. Stuff's bouncing around in our heads. Maybe we're kind of shutting down in some way because of our experiences. Let's take a breath and let's really do that. Take a breath, breathe in nice and deep, hold it, let it out slowly. Now, Agatha Christie was an amazing uh, writer and she concocted this lovable character called Inspector Poirot. And he said this once, it is the brain the little gray cells on which one must rely. And that's what I want us to keep in mind here. Let's work with our little gray cells. Keep those working. Put the emotions aside. As you were taking your deep breath, I wondered if you noticed that there's an elephant in your room. There is one. You can't see it. That's why that expression, that idiom is there. Well, it's there, folks. And the only way we know how to eat an elephant, or anyone could know how to eat an elephant, is one bite at a time. So why don't we take our first bite of that elephant that's wandering around in our space today? Verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. 
A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Consider the phrase in quietness and full submission. Let's, let's deal with this first. You know, folks, this doesn't mean that women should never talk. The sense here is peaceableness. Peaceableness. Let's go back to the context. Most likely women were being disruptive, argumentative, quarrelsome. We, Paul mentions that, anger and, and stuff like that. See, Paul wanted to tell them and teach them and remind them that this was supposed to be a learning experience, not a disruption. Sitting in the church, listening to the elders or whoever's teaching was to be a learning experience. And that, by the way, if you know anything about first century uh, society, was unusual. Usually men never learned with women. They would be segregated, not so in the church. They are to be there learning, just like the men that are sitting there listening or being involved in teaching are learning. See, Paul, remember, Paul wanted to restore orderly, holy worship in the church. Next, we have this uh, full submission. I can imagine now that's causing all sorts of little gray cells to be forgotten and emotions starting to come up. One commentator put it this way concerning full submission. Full submission has to do with the overall decorum of the woman. Decorum of the woman. Friends, this speaks to the modesty and dignity of a woman. This has nothing to do with a woman's ability to reason, to learn, to think, to speak. This has nothing to do with the importance of a man over a woman or a woman over a man. And we know that both apostles, Paul and Peter, have already spoken to us about the qualities of peacefulness and gentleness, which reveal the dignity of of a godly woman. Remember, we're talking today about men and women in the church and in the family that are Christian, that are true believers. That's what we're talking about today. That's what we're talking about. And here's the bottom line. Women in the first century church were free to ask questions. They were free to ponder and think and express their own ideas as they should be today in the church. For the Christian man and woman, the attitude of the heart toward God and others matters. That's what God is concerned. The character and integrity and godliness of a man and woman of God, or lack of it, will sooner than later be made manifest in their behavior. It has to come out one way or the other. Please also notice this in this chapter, in this actual verses that we're dealing with today, that Paul addressed both men and women. He is not setting up two standards here, as many would consider. We have a standard for men, and we have a standard for women. That is not what Paul is doing here. Remember, think biblically. James reminds us, reminds us, of our attitude as men and women before God. And James begins by saying, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Then he went on to say, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Did you notice here in James' letter, or James, what James said, submit yourselves then to God. Humble yourself. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You want to show me your love? You obey me. You obey me. We have problems with that in the church. We have definite problems with that in the culture. But we all submit to something, whether we recognize it or not. We either submit to our own selves, our own selfishness, our own uh, prejudices, our own biases, or we submit to God. We can't pick somewhere in the middle. And God will humble the proud 
and you will lift up the humble. That's the promise from God. Okay, that's the end of our first bite. We digested some of it, but now we're going to take the second bite of the elephant. And we're only going to deal with two bites today. And to leave it at that for now. Paul then said, here in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Again, we dealt with the word quiet. It doesn't mean a woman can't talk, reason, think, ponder, express herself. There's something else going on here. Remember, think biblically. This is one of those verses that has been abused in the church by men, abused in the culture, and that's wrong. That's just absolutely wrong. We know that this particular kind of language in our culture today would make many people gag and spit out something that would not be appropriate for me to repeat. But we don't have time to deal with this properly concerning the culture's paradigm concerning men and women, the culture's worldview today, except that it impacts the church as well. Because evangelicals often divide over this issue. And my argument, right from the beginning, is what the Bible is teaching us, is that we often are not thinking biblically. That some evangelicals read the Bible through their cultural biases. And they will actually use their biases to point to this text or that text, just as complementarians do to this text and this text. When you start proof texting, cherry picking verses to make your, uh, fit your paradigm, then you're not thinking biblically. For the egalitarian who believes and understands this text to be a cultural distinction back in Paul's day and does not apply to the church today, they're using their cultural biases. And the hard complementarian, we'll call it the hard, that's the other end, oh, as far as you can go, that understands this text. There's no time when a woman can teach a man in the church or out the church is, again, bringing, I believe, cultural biases and other things into it. They're not thinking biblically. The question for you and me is whether we are egalitarian or complementarian is this, are you thinking biblically? Because it's quite possible to be a complementarian and practice egalitarian things. And it's quite possible to be a like egalitarian and practice complementary things. Because nowhere in Paul's teachings will you find that women are inferior to men. So I ask you this question, can a woman be a president or prime minister of a country? That's uh, rhetorical, yes. Think of Golda Meir of Israel, Indira Gandhi of India, Margaret Thatcher of Britain, and more recently, Helen Clark of New Zealand. Can a woman be a CEO of a company, a CEO of a major top 500, uh, Fortune 500 companies? Yes. There's Mary Barra, CEO of General Motors, Jane Fraser, CEO of Citigroup, to mention a few. Paul's teaching here has nothing to do with the ability of a woman, period. Whether they want to be a president, flying a jet fighter, anything. What this is all about is simply this. Spiritual leadership in the church and spiritual headship in the home. Spiritual leadership in the church and spiritual headship in the home. And the good question to ask, and by the way, that's applicable only to true believers. Even though God designed it for all people, they're not following it, necessarily. We, as Christians, need to understand that this is important to God. So a good question to ask, how does Paul support his teaching concerning spiritual leadership in the church? Does he come up with some sort of philosophy, some sort of theory, some sort of hypothesis on his own? Is he remembering his experiences growing up in the first century Jewish home? By the way, he also had a Roman influence because he was born with a Roman uh, citizenship. 
He knew Gentiles, he knew Jews, he knew others. Was it his family origin? No. What Paul appeals to theologically, and he's thinking biblically, is the very beginning. He goes all the way back to the very beginning in the biblical sense that goes back to Genesis. And he says here in verse 14, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. See, his theological, biblical understanding concerning the role of men and women in the church was located with God in his created order. Now, of course, interpreting this and making it contextual for us today is difficult. It is difficult. But the Word of God, and, and he tells Timothy this, is authoritative, inerrant, and sufficient for all our needs. So we must have a go at it and trust that the Holy Spirit will help us along the way, understanding the importance of spiritual leadership in the church and in the family. Remember I began with a quote from Mary Cassian that started to fire up those little gray cells in our head, started us thinking about this issue? Here's another one from Mary. Do I love what God loves, she says? Am I treasuring Jesus by treasuring God's model of headship? Do I uphold it and support male headship as a good and beautiful aspect of God's wise plan? Does how I exercise my teaching gift indicate that I value it? These are good questions. See, Paul is not supporting his biblical teaching from cultural norms, different century traditions or values, but he's teaching it because it's part of, as Mary put it, God's wise plan. Nowhere in Paul's teaching will you find that God treats men and women unequally. Paul teaches the dignity of both men and women before God. That God created male and female in his image. Men and women are equal before God. But equality is not sacrificed according to the hard according to the egalitarian, contextual, cultural views. Because men and women have different roles in the church, just as they have different roles in the family. And when it comes to spiritual leadership in the church, we find God's wise plan in his order of creation. Just study that. Read that biblically. Read the creation order. Everything was put in proper order before the next thing came. There's, God is a God of order. God is a God of order. Listen to this. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And then God created woman. Where he, where he said, then the Lord, the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And then Adam named her the woman, for he said she was, taken, she was taken out of man. So with this in mind, how are we to interrupt, interrupt, interpret Paul's teaching concerning the role of men and women in the church? Now, if we take a hard tack one way or the other, when it comes to spiritual leadership, I guarantee you, you will miss this teaching. If we believe that Paul's teaching was cultural, and therefore there is no distinctions whether one is male or female and their roles in a church, we will in a way diminish the very value that God has created through the uniqueness of men and women. God created men and women with distinct, distinct roles and in the family and in the church. They bring these wonderful things that God has created in a male and in a, in a female, and it brings them together. When we fulfill our distinctive roles in our worship, our holy, proper worship, we reveal God to the world. For God is the God of order. We glorify God. And if we read this text through our cultural lens, our biases, our traditions, our families, our oranges, our experiences, we will not be thinking biblically. In that way, we can't really read the Bible the way it was intended. Because verse 12 and 13 is not teaching that men are better than women because they are responsible 
uh, to lead and teach. Verse 14 is not teaching that women are worse sinners than men. Don't get that sense out of it. Remember who abdicated his role, Adam, when he allowed Eve to eat the fruit. You see what happened when the serpent tempted Eve. He attacked uh, God from the flip side of his created order. He didn't come right at Adam. He came at Eve. The created order was flipped on its head. And verse 15 is not teaching that women must stay at home uh, barefoot and pregnant in order to be saved. That has nothing to do with it. Because if you're thinking this, and you believe this, and I don't think you're thinking biblically. Remember the Proverbs 31 woman. If you don't know what that is, read Proverbs 31, and you'll find her in there. She was a mother. Uh, she was a wife. She was a grandmother. She was, uh, ran a home-based business. She bought and she sold land. She prepared the land and organized all that. She taught her male and female kids the instruction of God, and she helped her husband in his work as well and in his leadership. She provided a valuable role, worthy of honor, worthy of honor. Now, we've barely addressed this issue, folks, that has really huge ramifications in this 21st century for the evangelical church. Moving on. There's so many variables we haven't considered. Both sides of these issues have important contribution, I believe, to offer to the orderly worship in the church. Remember, remember, prayer, context, and think biblically. And remember, study the Bible. Don't read one verse a day. I don't recommend that. Read content. Get the content in. Stick to a letter. Read it five times. You will know it inside and out. Study it. Prayerfully. Context. Yes. Know our context. Know that context where the letter is written from. And think biblically. In closing, I want to leave these final words to um, Desiring God uh, article I found. Or actually a, a fellow by the name of Greg Morris who, who often writes for Desiring God. God.org. And he said this. So in closing, and then I'll pray. He said this. Distinctions between male and female draw straight line and sacred lines to Christ and his church. A beauty we will dance and defend until the last and greatest wedding when Jesus returns and takes his bride, the church. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Lord, in these days, with so many, so many issues around men and women and the abuse of women by men and even men being abused by men and possibly women, I doubt it though sometimes. It seems ridiculous to think that. But Lord, that's just my thoughts on that. But I pray, Lord, that you will help us as people of God to, to understand that what you have put in here is not only your will and purpose when it comes to men and women and their roles in the church and the family. But it is for our own very own well-being, for the safety of our children. And Father, I pray for those who are being hurt right now as I speak by the abuse of the power and all those things. And Lord, that is wrong. I pray for them. I pray for their protection. And Lord, for, for even men who think they can use the Bible as a weapon, I pray for them that you would grant them repentance, that they would turn their hearts and minds back to you and beg forgiveness from you and then make amends with those they hurt. And for leaders in the church who have done so and abused their power, I pray that they too would repent and that uh, they would understand that possibly that's the end of their ministry and it's time to move on. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness in our lives. I thank you. I pray for everyone listening to this or watching it, however it's happening. I pray for them, each and every one. I pray for peace. I pray for the peace, of understand, uh, the peace that only surpasses our understanding that you get from Jesus. I pray for their health. I pray for healing. 
I pray for those who are struggling in abusive situations, that they would find the help that they need. That they would know that you understand that you want to help them. Would they depend on you through all this? And I thank you, Lord, so much for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, take care. Have a great day. Shalom.